Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for your patience and sticking around. I, of course, want to thank the session organizers for their um, uh, putting us all together in the same room, and um, especially for including what is really a rather non-technical, broad and shallow paper on Africa. And I have learned so much in this session that I wish I could go home and quickly rewrite um, parts of my presentation. However, I think it's worth um, looking at what we know and don't know about Africa right now in the context of this increasingly rich record uh, for Eurasia. I'd also like to just say that I'm lactose intolerant. I'm mainly European, but I'm a quarter uh, Iberian and also um, a little bit Native American and whatever ancestor gave me lactose intolerance, it started when I was two. So <laughs> this whole session has given me a stomach ache, although I'm fascinated <laughs> intellectually. Um, anyway, uh, what I wish to do today is to outline how uh, East African pastoralism and dairy, and that of African herders in general, may differ in its origins and interactions from those of groups practicing other subsistence technologies and property relations. Um, and also from that of Eurasian pastoralism and dairying, at least as we know it right now, because my suspicion is as we know more, um, oops, I'm so sorry. I was trying to drag this down a little. Oh, yeah, this is going to be a mess. It's okay. Yes, you can do that. Okay. All right. Next one? Yeah, next one. Thank you. <laughs> So, um, African, uh, in Southwest Asia, as we all know, so I'll just run through this really quickly, cattle-based area emerged really, really early, central in BC, in the context of sedentary communities that were already committed to cultivation, as well as, as we know, hunting still in a big way, and the use of small stock, and it's too bad Richard membership couldn't be here this morning, but we all know um, his work and some of you are co-workers. Evidence suggests that this led also, I'm a zooarchaeologist, so it led to the phasing out of extraction of animal fats from bones, bone grease manufacture especially, but in some cases maybe even marrow recovery when marrow was marginal. Um, African Saharan dairying emerged in the context of this distinctively mobile lifestyle facilitated and demanded by domestic stock, especially toward the end of the African humid period, uh, with the gradual drying of the Green Sahara. Both uh, Lynn Saley and um, Marshall and Hildebrandt have stressed that African pastoralism from the outset diverged from the counterparts in Southwest Asia in different ways, but primarily Pastoralism emerged after the incorporation of domesticates into predominantly farming-based subsistence systems uh, in Southwest Asia. And of course, dairying was already in existence as well. Whereas in Africa, pastoralism and dairy is the earliest food production and precedes the appearance of settled village farming based on African domesticates by several thousand years. And although this was controversial 15 or 20 years ago, I don't think there's much argument about this today. Uh, by 2500 BCE, um, domestic morphology pearl millet, which is a form of millet um, indigenous to uh, the African Sahel, was incorporated um, into probably transhuman pastoral land use with light cultivation in the Tulipsi Valley, Valley tributary of um, the Niger River, as well as a little bit later in the Lake Chad Basin. So there was no settled farming um, until about the zero BCE CE um, boundary line, and notably, um, this uh, appeared after a pan-Sahelian drought in the first millennium BCE um, that 
um, but it is kind of a huge blank space in the archaeological record, as droughts often are. And when um, you get to have sites appearing again, what you do get is um, a um, considerable distribution of settled villages um, cultivating a variety of African cereals, legumes, and also um, uh, green vegetables and tree crops of various sorts. Pastoralism continued, and with the drying of the Sahara, um, went into Western Africa, Eastern Africa, and then later on, um, on through Central and Southern Africa. Now, what of dairying itself? Saharan rock art depicts um, cows with full udders and even some scenes that have been uh, interpreted as milking scenes. Uh, either contextually or by the position of people in relation to the back end of a cow. Um, and we know now, um, and most of you in this room are familiar with the Dunn et al. Uh, paper um, that uh, appeared in 2012, that there are dairy lipids appearing at, uh, they start to make up 50% of shirts, or 50% of shirts had dairy lipids in them between 5,200 um, and uh, 20, I'm sorry, I've lost my place here, 3,800 in the um, Takar Kori uh, rock shelter sequence in southern Libya. Further support, of course, for the dairying comes from genomics, where Tishkoff's at all or pioneering work showed the diversity of um, SNPs that appear to be associated with lactase persistence. And I know that some of you in this room know this much more than I do, so I'm just going to leave it there. However, once again, when you have both of these lines of evidence pointing to around the same period of time in the emergence of um, the use of milk and the traits, and we've already heard how there can be this plus and minus, so maybe that um, I always like to wet my finger and hold it up like this when we're talking about those age estimates based on mutation and selection rates. So um, these accord pretty well. Um, Tishkoff um, et al. estimate accords pretty well with what we see in the archaeological um, pottery fabric. Whoa. Now, um, I want to pick up on something that actually uh, Christina mentioned, which is that um, I think, too, that dairying is really a solution of sorts. Pastoralism is a solution, and dairy pastoralism is a solution to living in dry, grassy, and highly climatically variable environments. Not only can you convert um, uh, grass, which you can't eat directly, to um, human food in the form of meat, but also in the form of milk, which allows you to keep the birds at a certain level. And uh, once you are committed, in these zones, to ensuring herd survival, and these are zones that are not um, very good for cultivation, you're going to favor the survival of female animals. And lots of livestock studies of African pastoralists have shown that males are taken off in most of these species anywhere between very early in their lifetimes, like in the first six months for male cattle in some areas, to a year or two um, in some other areas. And in uh, caprines, it's usually about a year and a half for the males. Females are allowed to um, breed. 60% uh, plus losses are common today, even with artificially drilled boreholes and other sorts of support systems for livestock. So traditional pastoral systems have thanks, uh, tried to create dual insurance policies, if you will, one being uh, far-flung 
networks of reciprocal livestock loans and gifts, which will allow one to replace lost stock, but the other, of course, is keeping as many females alive as possible during the good years in order that some come through the bad years. And I would say that milk is the optimal lifetime product from these females. Um, you could also bleed them, but um, repeated bleeding, which is done in Africa during drought periods, tends to run the livestock down. And of course, what you're trying to do is, is foster the survival of females. <coughs> so, um, oops. OK. The only, I'm sorry, I'm, okay, so the only other thing that um, I, I'd like to say about this, which is something that sort of come in earlier, has to do with who really benefits the most selectively from being able to digest lactose as well as casein, and those are wean children. And as many of you know, probably from studying a little bit about droughts and, and human suffering in the world today, it's actually weaned children or children who sudden, whose mothers don't fail who are the most vulnerable to dying. So that is a real selective pressure cooker for um, marginal environments where people commit to pastoralism are also those environments where selected selection is going to be the highest. Uh, do we want to come in? We've got about four minutes. Four minutes. Okay. Okay. So uh, we can go back to that in discussion. <coughs> now, I did throw in something about uh, resistance. And I want to back up the camera a little from all the great science that's been done in here and think about the uh, pastoralist and dairy pastoralist as people. People with stakes, with skin in the game, as some Americans say, um, who have specific interests that may, over time, be expressed in the rejection as well as the acceptance of technological innovations. Um, so, what we may be seeing in East Africa with close analysis of fauna remains um, is a phenomenon with which uh, governments in Africa, as well as other parts of the world where pastoralists live, are quite familiar. And that's pastoralist reluctance to cede over <coughs> any control of their autonomy and ownership and movement to others. Despite government's best efforts, um, to constrain pastoralist autonomy, they are deemed annoyingly resistant to the point of some governments trying to exterminate them to incorporation on terms other than their own. This may actually have a long history. And there are some rare bone modifications from the site of Aave Makonge at Lukenya Hill, which led me to think this through a little bit. I'll be quick. This is an Inselberg not too far from Nairobi, about 40 kilometers southeast, with a very dominant microlithic tool tradition for early pastoralist sites, typical ceramics as well of the early pastoralist sites that occupied um, the Central Rift, the Ahikapiti Plains, the Mara Loita, and the Serengeti Plains from around 1000 BCE until about 1200 CE. As at other such sites in the region, cattle predominate at this site. Um, and uh, it's interesting when you think about the turnover rates, lifetime cycles for cattle versus sheep and goats, that there's so many cattle. It means, I think, that there were a lot of cattle and not that many sheep and goats. Um, now, Lukenia uh, also has a lot of animals in the 24 to 36 month age of death, which is very different from anything you see in modern cattle, and they they are bigger cattle than what you would see in comparable herds today, reflecting perhaps a richer environment. And we can talk about why. Now, the, at this point in time, uh, people using iron and producing iron implements are only 
about 600 kilometers away, which is not much when you consider pastoral rounds of movement in a year, and especially the overlapping communication uh, systems that one finds between different regional populations. However, for a good deal of time, from at least 200 of um, the, before um, the Common Era until 1200 of the Common Era, these pastoralists did not adopt metal. They stayed with stone. And the reason that I started thinking about this was because they found some marks of metal at this one site. There's something like 10,000 microliths and other stone um, tools and debitage at this site. And then there were marks that several of us, including a forensic anthropologist, um, have decided, this is sort of hard to see, uh, could only have been made with some sort of metal tools. There are no other, none of the hallmarks of um, the uh, sorts of um, stone tool traces that you see, shoulder rings, striations, any of that, um, in or on any of these surfaces. So I started thinking, um, what is going on here? And, you know, one of the things is that most archaeologists, although they would reject 19th century evolutionism, tend to implicitly assume that a technological innovation will spread almost automatically through populations. And you know, my question was, well, gee, if a little metal was good for a few people at the site, why not a lot? Um, and I think it was because the esoteric practices of these um, metal-producing people and the social power that it accorded those with that esoteric knowledge were deemed a certain kind of threat to people that have property relations who could do very well without metal tools. And it wasn't until farmers moved into their areas and adjacent um, areas in great numbers that pastoralists did not, uh, did convert to um, uh, metal tool use. And in that situation, there was a kind of a encapsulation as a subservient caste of metal workers within East African pastoral societies. So it is simply, um, if I will, you know, I know I'm over time and I'll just stand here, sort of a, a moment to step back and think, well, you know, this is fascinating stuff and I'm just so fascinated by the work people are doing. But to think about the stakes of adopting or not adopting a technology. Um, including dairying among certain people. What does it give them? What does it get them? And it's not always just nutritional. There may be some social considerations of power and um, as asymmetries between interacting groups that people are taking into account in those decisions. Thank you for your patience.